I'm Marsha Welsh, president of East Strasburg University, and I really thank you so much for joining us for uh, the first event in the Distinguished Entrepreneur Speaker Series featuring ESU alumnus Dan Dizio. Today's event marks the beginning of an exciting program at ESU as entrepreneurs invite us into their world to hear their stories, sharing insights for pursuing our own passions. Throughout my academic career, it has always been my passion to seek out innovative opportunities that support student success. Since coming to ESU, I've been inspired by the entrepreneurial spirit that has been the heart of this university for over 120 years and which guides our students on their journey to success. As the CEO and founder of the world's largest Philly-style pretzel bakery, Dan Dizio, a 1995 graduate of ESU, is a prime example of this success. He is here to tell us about his successes and failures that brought him to where he is today. After graduation, Dan briefly worked as a stockbroker before he and his college roommate, Len Lehman, agreed to take the plunge, starting a business together. Len graduated in 1994 and at that time, at that time was a psychiatric counselor. Dan presented a plan to Len to go into the pretzel business. It was something he knew a little bit about, given that at the age of 11, he would help a neighbor sell bags of fresh pretzels to drivers stopped at red lights in Northeast Philadelphia. It wasn't easy, but through hard work, perseverance, and a lot of knowledge picked up along the way, Philly Pretzel Factory has grown to more than 200 locations in 19 states. The company now boasts sales of more than 700 million and will sell more than 175 million pretzels this year. Philly Pretzel Factory is listed among the top franchises in Entrepreneur Magazine and Franchise Market Magazine, and their offerings have consistently won local Best Pretzel, best pretzel Contest. As the company's CEO, Dan Dizio is a recipient of the Excellence in Franchising Award from Smart CEO Magazine, and he was a finalist for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. ESU couldn't be prouder to have Dan and Len's story as a part of our legacy of accomplished alumni. And I have to say, Dan comes up for homecoming, Dan shows up when we ask him, he has been an absolutely incredible alum. I, I don't, he's, I've asked him not to tell you everything about his history, because. <laughs> but he does, I, it's interesting to see how he and his classmates still stick it out, they come together, they, you know, they do a lot of things together, they really were uh, a force to be reckoned with. So in addition to his insights, that the insights that Dan will share with us tonight, I'd also like to highlight another opportunity for ESU entrepreneurs, and especially students, who are looking for that first step toward making their own mark in the world. ESU's Business Accelerator has worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs for nearly two decades to provide support and resources for startups and established businesses alike in the profit and the not-for-profit world. In the audience tonight, we have two previous first place winners of the State System Student Business Plan Competition, Jonathan Weber, Class of 2012, and Blaise Delfino, Class of 2016. Both of these accomplished alumni have gone on to create companies and serve as mentors for future entrepreneurs. I highly encourage anyone who is inspired by Dan's words tonight, which I trust will be all of you, to seek out the ESU Business Accelerator as Jonathan and Blaze have done so that you may define your own success. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening at the first of what is certain to be a long and successful series of invigorating discussions about entrepreneurship and the many pathways to success. Please join me now in welcoming Dan Dizio, ESU class of 1995 and CEO of Philadelphia Philly Pretzel Factory. Dan. We're going to show you a quick video here, I think, just, just to give you some B-roll, uh, which is just to give you some familiarity with the pretzel business. I don't know if anybody's, just by a show of hands, who's been to a Philly pretzel factory before? Oh, perfect. Keep me in business, that's great. <laughs> so that's terrific. Well, why this is running, I, 
you know, I just want to say it is truly an honor to be here. Um, I know people say that all the time when they give speeches and all, but for me to graduate from here and to come back, uh, it gave me goosebumps to drive up here. I was really excited about it. Um, you know, being here, it's been almost 20 years now. I graduated in 95, 22 years, uh, and it just flew by, and I have so many great memories of this school. And I can tell you, if I didn't come to the East Stroudsburg University, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, the relationships that I built, and I'll go into some of those later, um, are really were forged and made here at East Stroudsburg. Um, in fact, while I was driving up here, I called my mom to tell her I was coming up here, and. Uh, you know, to speak, and you know, she started crying when I was on the phone with her, and she was that flattered. So, if nothing else, if you get nothing out tonight from me, know that you made my mom very happy tonight. Very <laughs> proud. So, I, I appreciate that. So, a little bit about the story about um, how I got into the pretzel business. I think it should give you a little bit of a um, background on it. So, I grew up in a town called Ben Salem, right outside of Northeast Philadelphia. Uh, my next door neighbor owned a pretzel bakery, uh, and. Uh, Sure enough, when I was 11 years old, I was out back kicking a ball, and my next door neighbor came over and he got stuck with a thousand pretzels uh, that Saturday morning. And he basically asked if I would stay on the street corner and we'd sell the pretzels and split the money. Um, back then, pretzels were five for a dollar, a long time ago, and uh, sold them, brought in $200. I got 100, he got 100. And uh, at the time, my allowance was three bucks a week. So this was nine months worth of allowance in one day. So I hit the gold rush. Um, so I said, let's do it again. And uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm 46 in a couple of weeks. So this is uh, a long, 35 years ago. And uh, so did it then, then next thing I know, every weekend I was selling pretzels on the street corner. Then after school, I was selling pretzels on the street corner. And within a couple of months, everyone in school found out that I was selling pretzels, making all this money. I, I, I used to walk around with big wads of $1 bills. So it really looked like I was even making even more money than I was. And uh, so sure enough, my job somehow became the organizer for this guy, Steve, who would tell me, I need 45 guys today. And this is way before cell phones, text messaging, you know, uh, I would have to do it the old fashioned way, call 45 guys at 5.30 in the morning and say, meet us at 6.30 or seven o'clock in the morning. And he would set us up all around Philadelphia. Every corner, if anybody's down from Northeast Philadelphia, every street corner was full of them. Um, and you know, I can't believe, in fact, I make the joke all the time. Um, before, when he asked me if I would sell pretzels, he said, one thing's first, I have to ask your mom if it's okay for you to sell pretzels on the street corner. And for some reason, my mom said it would be okay for me to stay on Roosevelt Boulevard, which is a 12-lane highway if anybody knows the road. I'm still always amazed by that. She hates when I tell that part of the story. She says, leave that part out. Um, she goes, it was a different time back then, I started her story. So, so I did it all through middle school, um, into high school, and uh, once I went to high school, I, 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 I told the president that I would not bring the story out, but I actually am trying to throw it in there. So I was doing so well in the pretzel business, I, I stopped going to school. Not a good thing to do, but I, I did stop going to school. I just started selling pretzels uh, every day, uh, seven days a week. Um, I was doing, making a lot more than I could ever dreamed I was going to make. And uh, so until that one fateful day in uh, May, I remember clearly it was right after my birthday, May 7th, um, I got a door ringing the doorbell, and uh, two sheriffs are there. And they're there to arrest my mom. And my mom's in the shower. So they go upstairs, and they, they knock on the door, and they arrest my mom in a bathrobe for me for selling pretzels on the corner. Uh, she, they thought, my dad had died a couple years prior, and they thought my mom was forcing me to sell pretzels to feed the family. And uh, she had no idea. I was faking report cards. She had no clue. Um, but long story short, I got on the straight and narrow, and uh, I did pretty good in school after that. From that point on, we got we got straightened out. It was an eye-opening, awakening moment for me. But again, still did it on the weekends, and still did it after school. Even when I came to East Stroudsburg, I would still go home on the weekends as the first year um, and go and sell pretzels. So it was sort of what I loved to do, and it was it was very lucrative back then. Started playing ice hockey up here, and then I stopped with the pretzels, and sort of where it ended. Um, graduated, became a stockbroker, and just was not used to sitting at a desk all day. It just was very difficult for me. Um, so did it for about a year, and kept talking to my partner, Len, who apparently was my partner by the time. We were college roommates here in East Stroudsburg, um, and kept bringing an idea up about this pretzel thing. He didn't know anything about the pretzel business. And I had said to him, listen, this is the way it works. There's 10 pretzel bakeries in the Philadelphia area, um, and they all go to work at three or four in the morning, they twist pretzels, 
they'd take them and they'd all close by nine o'clock in the morning. And that was sort of the way it was in Philadelphia. And they sold them to schools, hospitals, and on vendors and street corners. And that's just the way it was. And they always closed by nine, nine thirty. Why someone never changed it until we came along, I, I still don't know that. But they did very, very well. So I told Lenny about it, and Lenny was a golfer at the time. He loved the golf when he was up in Stroudsburg. So uh, he said, I could golf. All he heard, I told him we were going to make money, da, da, da. He didn't hear anything else. He heard, so I could be on the golf course by 10 o'clock every day. <laughs> he said, you'll be on the golf course by 10. So he was in, didn't really know much about it. Um, and the one tricky part, the reason there was 10 pretzel bakeries in, in Philadelphia was there was only 10 pretzel machines in Philadelphia. Um, no one ever let you see these pretzel machines. They produced a rope string, and without that machine, you really couldn't get in the business. And if there was 20 pretzel machines, there would have been 20 pretzel bakeries in Philadelphia. Um, but the guys who owned them didn't let you see them because nobody wanted to make, have someone make one and start being competition. These guys were a real closed group. So as a stockbroker, I had access to a phone all day. So I used to call all day and try to find a pretzel machine or someone who would make me one. And sure enough, luck would have it after almost 11 months of doing it, I found one in Florida. A guy years ago, 25 years beforehand, had tried to open a pretzel bakery up in Florida and uh, opened up that, didn't do well, and he put it in his garage. So sight unseen, this is before pictures and email and stuff. Uh, I'm sure email was around, but not, it was 1998. We, uh, we flew to Florida with our life savings in our pockets. And uh, we went down there and we find this machine, the guy opens his garage up and puts on it. Now I've been in the pretzel business a little bit at that point, I've been doing the business a while, but Len had never even seen a pretzel machine before. And this thing, a lawnmower was sitting on top of this machine <laughs> that was made out of plywood and wires sitting out. And this was our life savings we were buying this machine with. And everything that we've ever worked for, in fact, he borrowed the money um, for his. I went with a different approach. I, I decided uh, that, it, Maybe they don't still have them, I don't know, but they, I went and got a credit card and I opened up a bunch of credit cards. This isn't a well thought out business plan, by the way, so <laughs> this is what not to do. Uh, so I went and uh, got 10 credit cards opened up and I cash advanced all the credit cards uh, for the maximum I could get. And that's where I got this money. So th now we're in Florida with this cash, we're about to buy this machine and it looks, I've seen pretzel machines before, but this is the worst one I've ever seen in my life. And Lenny pulls me aside and he goes, there is no way that I'm taking my life savings and putting it on that. He goes, I don't even, this isn't even my money I'm using um, to buy this thing. So I agree with him. I really did. I said, that, I, I just can't risk all of everything we have. We're 24 years old and we're putting everything on the line for this thing in someone's garage. And Lenny said, well, can we plug it in and see if it works? Well, he's like, it's three phase, if anybody knows what that term means. And basically it means you can't plug it in um, in someone's house anyway. So we leave. Now we flew to Florida, but we rented a U-Haul truck to come home because we thought we're coming home with a pretzel machine. Well, it turns out we don't have a pretzel machine in the back of the truck. And I drive, this is a true story, I drive about 50 yards and I stop the truck at the stop sign. And I swear this is not made up at all. I sit down and I go, Len, if we go home, we're going back to what we're not happy about our life. And this is a point where we can make a decision, go this way or we can go that way. And I said, uh, you know, I, I just don't want to go that path. I want to take the chance. We have the opportunity, let's take the chance here. Uh, it was this real inspirational story, and I'm not that guy. I usually don't have that kind of quote, but I really did have this plea with him because um, I wanted it so bad. And I said, listen, let's go back and I think we can negotiate with the guy. And we agreed to buy this thing for $20,000. And uh, so we go back and we start negotiating. Now we got to this guy's house at 11 o'clock in the morning. We have dinner at his house at eight o'clock. We're negotiating at midnight, still negotiating. And it finally at one in the morning, I think the guy just had enough <laughs> and we wore him down and we finally settled on $11,000 and we, and we got the machine and we, we drove home again. That was really the beginning for us. Um, and from that point, we were able to find a location. And we were looking for what people typically do. And it, the reason I'm here tonight to sort of talk about the mistakes, but you know what we were gonna do? There was 10 pretzel bakeries out there and they were all in a warehouse on a back alley nobody knew from. And that's what we were gonna do. We were gonna rent the exact same thing as everybody else does, just because they did it, right? And then we finally made a decision to put it on a retail street, on a street that people could come in and get these pretzels, not just one that closed up nine in the morning. And sure enough, we found this location. The rent was even cheaper than the warehouse spot we were gonna rent. And we ended up putting it in there. And the first day we opened, um, let me see here. 
By the way, this is the street corner of the first day I sold trucks, by the way, it's number one here. So this, you can see it is a 12 lane highway and I stood right in the middle of this island uh, there. And by the way, I'm surprised that some of these things picking up. I was the smallest kid in my high school. Uh, when I was in high school, I was only 4'11", 77 pounds. I was probably 60 pounds, so I can't even believe I was out there and the wind didn't just blow, a tractor trailer wind didn't just blow me over. But this is the way the store looked. This is the retail uh, store we took. This is when we opened May 2nd, 1998. Um, and we opened up, uh, we ran there and switched it across at the four in the morning like everybody else does. And we opened the doors at six o'clock and zero people were there. Um, and at seven o'clock, something interesting happened, the deli next door opened up for us. It was a real famous deli in Northern Philadelphia. And people started getting their lunch meat, Saturday morning getting their lunch meat. And they started to trickle over. And by nine o'clock when I told Lenny we were gonna be closed at, when he could go golfing, we had a line of 45 people in line. And uh, the line didn't go away till five o'clock in the afternoon. And I told Lenny at the end of the day that he could sell his golf clubs because we were going to stay open the rest of the day. Um, and really the moral of this story is we were just going to do what everybody else did. And just, you know, we didn't invent the pretzel. We really just invented the process, uh, changed the process and the way we delivered it. And it was hot, fresh pretzels all day. The reason of, uh, our tagline is hot out of the oven pretzels was a mistake. We couldn't keep up with the demand because Lenny was baking, I was twisting and working the door. And we would literally just bag the pretzels and hand other people and they were blazing hot. And you know what they would do? They were so hot, they would go, give me another 10, give me another 20, they were buying more. And we knew we were on to something special, that when you give somebody hot pretzels, they even buy more of them. And the original place was gonna be a wholesale pretzel bakery, so we had tiered pricing. So the more you buy, the better the price you get. And our original pricing was four for a dollar, um, 10 for $2, 30 for $5, 50 for $7, and 100 for $13. So when people would come in just for four pretzels, then they were like, well, just give me 10. And then they were like, give me 30. Give me, and they would just sell themselves on why to buy more. They don't even know what the heck they're gonna do with 100 pretzels, but they bought them. <laughs> and they all justified, I could freeze them, I could do something. So that was sort of, we, we, we caught something special. Now, the store was only pretzels and soda, that's all we sold. We didn't even have cheese, uh, we did have mustard at the time. So this is how it looked uh, when we were under construction. This is the original store, that's me and Len. I don't know what we were doing. We were sort of just makeshifting it. We didn't even, we didn't even open with a cash register. Um, that's how unthought out the plan is. And it's crazy for me to come back here and see, you know, you guys had this, you know, incubator. And what's the term? I'm sorry. I keep using innovation, innovation, center. innovation center. And it's so exciting to be able to know that these business practices, how much we could have learned and really taken advantage of. And I wish we had done the more homework before because we would have missed a lot of the mistakes that we had. In fact, when we came in here, we opened the store up, and uh, the health department has to come out and give you an inspection. So uh, we had 38 critical violations. Uh, and the guy said, absolutely not, you're not opening. And then he, as he's walking around, the funny part was, he came up to us and he's walking through the whole store, and he goes, one question for you. Where's the bathroom? And I looked at Len, and I go, we built a store and we forgot to put a bathroom in this true story. No bathroom, there's no bathroom in the store. And I go, how did we miss a bathroom? So the guy goes, what are you gonna do for a bathroom? And I was like, there's a diner across the street, right? The main for the diners across the street. And he goes, what if they're closed? I go, they're open 24 hours a day. And he goes, absolutely not. We're not basing on another business. You gotta get a bathroom. So long story short, we ended up getting those things fixed. We don't have any health violations now, by the way, so you should feel comfortable that Coming on So here's Lenny serving uh, our first uh, first week of pretzels. And the next year, so we had great success that first year. Made dream come true. In fact, let me cut back because I want to talk about Len here. So Len graduated in 1994. This was a dream for both of us, but man, it took off. And sometimes it's the saying is, be careful what you wish for. But we never dreamed we would have the lines at the door. We would have them all day. And let me give you a picture of a snapshot of our lifestyle. We would start twisting pretzels at midnight. We would twist them until about four in the morning, then we would deliver them to the airport. We were lucky enough to get the airport account, which was a big order for us every, every day, seven days a week. We would then twist and bake all day long until five o'clock. We'd close the doors at five. We'd drive to Sam's Club. We would load our car up with flour, and we didn't know there was places that would deliver this stuff. Um, again, not a well thought out plan. We would buy the uh, um, flour, all the ingredients there, and if you ever go in Sam's Club, you know they have the boxes at the front of the store? We would grab all those boxes. We'd take them all. Um, they were our packaging material. So if you ordered 50 or 100 pretzels, 
that was sort of what they came in early on. Uh, so we leave there, we come back, we literally sit on the floor, count up our money. We, uh, our accounts receivable was a sheet of drywall. And we, we would write, if somebody bought something on an account, we would write it on the wall. And if you paid us, we crisscrossed it out. And uh, that was sort of how we started this business. Again, not a, a well-oiled machine here, uh, to say the least. But you know, we had something special. People loved the product, they loved the pricing, loved everything about it, but man, it was a curse. So after we did that, so it's about seven o'clock, we used to go home every night for one hour. We eat dinner and shower. We come back and we sleep on the flower bed from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock every night. Uh, and the reason being is, if one of us would have went home and slept in a regular bed, we would have never made it to work. So by sleeping there, we did seven days a week. In fact, it was so good, the business was so good, three months into it, um, we were exhausted. I used to put my car and park at red lights because I would drift into the traffic if I, I would fall asleep at the lights. And Lenny came to me after three months and he said, here's the keys. I don't want it anymore. Um, I'm not interested in it. And I said, he said, the reason I got in this was the quality of life. And I wanted something better for my family and the quality of life. And this is no life. I haven't seen my wife. I haven't seen, I, I'm trying to have this baby. I'm trying to have family. And I'm trapped in this store all the time. Um, and at that point, it was an eye-opening moment because I didn't have anybody else. Now, it could have been a great deal for me. I could have got the store after store for, for nothing, but um, I didn't have anybody else. I mean, there was no way for me to do it all by myself. So that's when we had the epiphany moment of we got to do something different. What we're doing is we're caught in a rut, and we're just trying to do the same thing every day. And the problem is the business is getting busier every day. So we're, we're in the worst shape three months than we were the first day, which is hard to believe. So what we did was we called all our old college fraternity brothers. We were Phi Sigma Kappa fraternity down here on Anna Lemon Street. We called our buddies and we said, whatever you're making, we'll pay you more than you're making. And uh, I, they all, pretty much everybody said, okay, it'll be like a big frat house and then we're gonna be buddies again hanging out. Everybody agreed. I was telling this story earlier. So I called one other person. He did not ag agree right away. So he said, let me sleep on it and I will, uh, I'll get back to you. And he goes, calls me the next morning and he goes, I slept on it and he goes, I really should take it but I really like what I'm doing. I got passionate for what I'm doing. And uh, it was, most people probably know, it's James Franklin from uh, Penn State head coach. He was coaching at the time and uh, you know, he was struggling. It was early in his career and he was, it was not a well-paying job back then. And uh, he's the one guy that I turned this down. So I, he's not doing as well as pretzels, but I, I'm, I'm like it. It's, it's, it's worked out well for him. So um, the reason I bring this slide up is this is our second store we ever opened up. It went out of business. Um, we had the best success lines at the door of the first store with no shoestring budget. The whole store cost us $34,000, the first one. The second one cost us $300,000. We bought all brand new equipment. We did everything right. We had a designer design the store, architects, blueprints, the whole nine yards, and the store flopped. And uh, the reason I bring it up is, if there's entrepreneurs in the room, or anybody in, in, for that matter, um, you're going to have struggles. And for us to have the second store close, it was a humbling, humbling day when that store closed. And really a scary day. In fact, Lynn said to me, I'll never do another one. That's it. I'm done. Um, I'm going back to Mayco. That's our original store. And we're just keeping that one. Um, and at that point, that's when I was like, I want to grow. And I, I, it was a fluke. I, it just one bad store. We, we got to continue to go. And I went on to open up stores without Lynn. So after that first one, he just, he didn't really, He's a great partner, but he just didn't want to go through that failure again and thought, you know what, we had one great one and here we are with this failure and he couldn't absorb another failure doing the third store. But I ended up doing another store, did a store in, uh, down in Center City, if anybody gets down, this is an old photo of it, but it's 16th and Sampson. Um, this is one of our best stores in the system now. It was our, our third store. In fact, our franchisee, another guy who went to East Stroudburg, Ron Howe, graduated in 1994 as well. He, uh, he owns this store and 21 other stores. So again, the partnerships, the, the relationships that were started here in Stroudsburg uh, have continued to help my company and, and help themselves as well. So it's been great. Um, one thing I did a little unique is these were some stores early on that I went and did partnerships with. Uh, so what I did was I would find, some of these guys were East Stroudsburg alumni as well, and I would put up all the money, I would train them, and we would become 50-50 partners in these stores. And I had about 10 stores doing it this way, and it was really a success. So every year you can see I was starting to open up a store every year. Uh, until about 2005, 
we end up starting franchise in 2005. We had someone come to us and want to partner up and open a franchise. And the reason you see the Monopoly board is, um, it was kind of a, a special one for me. So my first franchise was at Boardwalk and Park Place, right on the corner of Boardwalk and Park Place. I'm a huge Monopoly guy. So for me to open up the first location there, um, and it was a huge success and uh, really catapulted us because they told a bunch of people how well they were doing. And sure enough, it, it caught on, and that's why the franchising model started really working. Um, the next year, uh, we started really growing and, and doing well. But guess what happens when you do well? People copycats, right? So remember all those guys I told you stole pretzels with me on the corner uh, early on? Well, they saw me doing well, and they all opened up stores. Um, and they went and did their own thing and did their stories. So these three guys were all competitors. And this is a crazy story when I tell you this. At one point, Every one of us had 22 stores on the butt. 20, everybody had 22 stores um, at the exact same point, point, which is just mind-boggling that we all get to the same point. The only difference was me and Len had decided that we made a, uh, a commitment early on that that original store I showed you, that me and Len would live off that store forever. That was it. Anything that this franchise thing did, we didn't know how well it did these multiple stores, we were gonna put all that money back into the infrastructure of the company and continue to hire people, uh, and that's what we did. We were fortunate enough that uh, Reader's Water Ice, I'm sure everybody knows Reader's Water Ice, they are right up the street from us. They got bought out at the same time a private equity firm bought them out, and they let go a lot of employees. And fortunate enough for us, they were a regional concept that nobody, everybody said, Water Ice can't franchise that all around the country. Um, so we were able to take a lot of those employees and hire them, and we really added to the infrastructure. And over the next couple of years, we ended up buying out things, facility, the bottom one, uh, gyms and pretzel boys collectively, they, one has two and one has three stores left. Um, and pretty much they're not franchising anymore. And the, really the moral to this story is that, you know, if you add to the infrastructure, you know, somebody asked me earlier if I could give any advice. And so one thing is we were doing pretty well financially with these stores, but we didn't go and, and change our lifestyle for it. So we added it back to the business because frankly, you know, the business matters more than my lifestyle. And in fact, I joke around that the, the, the store had flat screen TVs way before I had a flat screen TV in my house. And, and that's, that's what a true entrepreneur does. They care more about the business than they care about their own stuff. Um, and frankly, some people will say, well, what about, you know, I want to make, I want to get into being an entrepreneur because I want to make a lot of money. And that is not the reason to be an entrepreneur. I can tell you that. There's other ways to make money. To be an entrepreneur, they go through the headaches and, and the ups and downs, uh, the late nights. Um, you have to do it because you believe and you want to build something and you enjoy it and you don't mind sacrificing Friday nights and Saturday nights with your friends to be in business. It was truly humbling those first couple of years for me and Len. Um, we used to always get shore houses when we went to East Stroudsburg down in the South Jersey Shore. And on Fridays, when we used to work, we'd be working Friday nights because we had so many orders for Saturday. People used to stop in and get pretzels on their way to the shore. And let me tell you, it's very difficult when you're 25 years old to stand there and twist pretzels and know you're gonna do that all weekend and all night when all your friends are going to the shore and having a good time. And the only thing that gets that through you through those weekends is that you believe in what you're doing and you enjoy it and you wanna to get to a certain climax and a certain spot uh, in life. And you're, work, well, you're willing to sacrifice those weekends to be, uh, to be that passionate about the business. So, so as the time dealer put in infrastructure, uh, the things that changed it was for us, we really created an executive team. We hired from uh, the readers, as I told you. We had to create a development department, which was great. We got the uh, former CEO of Vaco, is our chief development guy now. Uh, we had support managers that visit the stores. Uh, we hired a marketing uh, company, and then we have our own in-house marketing as well. Um, we had research and development. We had hundreds and hundreds of products in the pipeline. And people say, where are all of them? Because I know you guys have the party trays, I know you do cheesecake pretzels and all. Um, the problem for us is, the one thing that we believe in in this, uh, one of our, our founding principles, is the simplicity of the model. People go to a pretzel store, they know what they're gonna get. We don't want to become a convenience store or to compete with other businesses out in the world. I, I, sometimes we have franchisees who uh, want us to add more items, more sandwich pretzels, make it a pretzel deli, add this, add newspapers, chocolate milk, add all these things. And the problem for us is, you know, that's such a competitive world. In fact, when I was 14 years old, I used to ride my bike up to a bike shop and it was a McDonald's next to it. And I used to buy a cheeseburger there, it was 69 cents for a single cheeseburger. This is 32 years ago. 
I can go to that same McDonald's 32 years later, and I can buy a double cheeseburger today for 99 cents. And that shows you how competitive the food industry is. So me and Len and, and our friends that are in this world where we're just making pretzels, we do a tremendous amount. I mean, we do 175 million pretzels this year. Um, but we're in this world where we don't have any direct competition. There's all competition out there. Every food is competition. And people always say Amy Ann's. We don't look at them as competition. They're a mall based business that isn't really what we do. We're, our average customer buys 35 pretzels when they come in our store. It's a lot of pretzels for people to come in. So, um, so after that, we started to hire PR firms. Uh, we uh, really, the, one of the early things we did was hire a PR firm, and man, it made a difference. It was the one best advice I gave it earlier to some um, young entrepreneurs is if you don't have a big marketing budget, the best thing you can do is to do PR. Whether you do it yourself and mail things out to newspapers, articles, to uh, news magazines, they're looking for content. But we hired a company and they did tremendous for us. I and mean, the amount that it cost us is a fraction to the value we received. We could never buy the amount of advertising that we, uh, we get with the PR side of it. Traditional, the pretzel is our, our baby. Uh, it still is and probably will be forever. I mean, the traditional pretzel is really our core product that we have, but we have added the pepperoni melt, cheesesteak pretzels. The pretzel party tray, which didn't exist 10 years ago, is 25% of our business. We have some stores that do not sell anything in their store except for party trays on the weekends. Uh, up in Delaware, New York, up on Long Island, New York, there's a store. He does not sell regular pretzels because he's so booked up. He's going to open another location uh, in the next couple months. But all he can do is he has full orders for party trays. It's unbelievable how well he's doing up there. Um, as we grow, we got some recognition and are in the top 200 for uh, Franchise Times Magazine, which is a, a big deal, and really gave us some credibility uh, out there. Uh, all these things, nothing jumped us to where we are today. It's all little incremental things that have built upon each thing. These are some of our stores, the airports, the amusement parks that we've gotten involved in. We're all over the place. Um, and this was in 2007, we hit our 100th store, so it was a big, a big deal of franchising. Your 100th unit is a huge, huge deal. Um, it really sets the tone of, it's not just a regional thing, it's not just one neighborhood likes your product. Once you hit 100 stores in franchising, it's understood that that product should work nationwide and it should continue to grow. And that's where we are now, 19 states. Uh, hopefully in the next year or two, we'll be in all 50 states. We're really starting to grow west and doing well there. Um, with that PR, uh, we were fortunate enough uh, I was fortunate enough to be on uh, Undercover Boss, and uh, it was a great experience for me. People asked about the question, asked about it a lot. Um, the one thing that stunk about it is it's three weeks um, of no contact with your family. You, I, your little boys couldn't see, talk to your boys, not even on a phone call. And it's kind of funny when the producers came out to uh, meet me. I, you know, I found me here to the interview, and uh, my pronunciation is not that good. It's not because of East Stroudsburg. I think it's just really bad. <laughs> but. Uh, I really thought I bombed it, and uh, they came back and they, you know, said, "Listen, we, we think we like it." And I said, "Listen, I want to be up front with you. I've watched it. Everybody's seen Undercover Boss, at least one of the shows." I said, "That show, those guys cry all the time. I don't cry. It doesn't happen. It's just I don't cry. I don't know. I don't. My body's not made up for that." And uh, sure enough, I do the episode. And since it's been on, I've been ranked the most emotional guy that's ever been on. I've cried <laughs> the most of every, uh, any of the other ball stuff. So. Um, but it was a great experience. It really was a great experience. And it really gave us a, a platform for people to get to know the brand outside of the Philadelphia region and really understand where we are. And, uh, the first night it had uh, 17 million viewers. So it really opened up uh, the door. And from that, what happens is, just like everything I said, everything's a little step here, a little step. The next day after the show aired, we got a, a call from Walmart, you know, and Walmart said, we want to start to put your stores inside, your bakeries inside the Walmart. Uh, currently, we have 37 stores inside Walmart, and uh, it continues to grow for us. Um, it looks like that's going to really expand for us over the next 12 months, but we were in a pilot program that's continued to grow, and they're really happy with uh, the relationship, because our, if you've been to our stores, you know we're a value-oriented menu, and it's meshes up with exactly what Walmart does, is looking for value. So. This is our airport location. Uh, we really got open in 2013. You can see, the reason I'm pointing these out is it's starting to show the migration of how the company started to, you know, we started to hire designers and add money to the stores, um, the finishes. 
And just somebody asked me about this earlier. So uh, did anybody see the Tennessee Bill Pass by any chance out there? This is, yeah. So this caught on big. We did this uh, a couple years ago when he got picked up by the Eagles. And then it was lightning in a bottle. Um, I think we had some 17 million likes or something, or 18 million likes in the first 24 hours. ESPN was calling, every show was calling about this. And the point of this is you never know in marketing what's going to stick. And it's somebody made this up, stupid little thing. We sent them to, when they signed them, it, everybody knew it was going to get cut probably from the Eagles. We sent them down to the Eagles camp. And uh, sure enough, next thing you know, every media outlet is calling and say an interviewer wanted to see the proctor come to the bakery and see it. So, so really the question of where are we at now, um, you know, as a, as a company, and we're, uh, our goal, we're 200 units now. We're going to be, our goal is 500 units by 2021. Um, so we think it's very achievable and uh, growing rapidly, really out of markets. We don't have any plans to be international yet. We want to stay local. Uh, well, not local, I should say nationally uh, company, but we're not really going international. It opens a whole Pandora's box of, of problems and challenges uh, that we will get to, but the country's a big country, and we feel like we have a lot of opportunity before we need to go that route. And what's exciting for us right now is we are uh, at the point of, we just moved now, I was just telling them, Monday, this past Monday, we just moved into our corporate headquarters. This was the former Rita's Woodwright uh, building. <coughs> So we just moved into this building, and uh, it's been a dream come true. So it's 25,000 square feet, and we're building a frozen production facility in there right now. But we're real excited where we are as a company. I mean, it's really set us up to be, you know, I had to pinch myself when I went into work this week to, to see the size of the operation and uh, the amount of people. We have about 250 employees that work for the corporate headquarters. Some of those are corporate stores that we currently own, and some are just executives that work in the the corporate office. So we continue to, to see the excitement. Um, so some people asked me, I'm sorry, some people asked me earlier about um, the guy who I got in the pretzel business with and what he's, uh, what he's up to. So he's been uh, the guy, and the reason I tell the story is I think it's, I'm not here to be an advocate um, for change, but I just want to give you some inputs of things that happened in my life that set me up where I feel like I'm a success. Uh, Steve, the guy setting up on the street corner, ended up uh, getting a drug problem. Now, this is a guy who I looked up to, uh, who set me up in this corner. So when he, had, when I was doing that well on the street corners back when I was a kid, he had 50 kids out in those corners all those years, doing tremendously well. And uh, sure enough, he ended up uh, getting hooked on drugs. And uh, when a few years ago, I got a, a door a ring on my doorbell, and. Uh, I thought of my girlfriend, I thought she was locked out. She was a bartender at the time. I thought she was locked out, I was gonna throw the key down to her. I looked out and there was snow out in the ground and sure enough, there was a cab out there and I looked down and it's the guy Steve, I saw across the floor. Um, he's standing there naked. He sold the clothes he was wearing uh, for crack cocaine. And, and the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is it was such a moment for me. I get goosebumps thinking about it in a negative way to, to watch somebody I looked up to um, who had everything in the world to live for. Um, forget the money, but he had the money, he had free time, he had flexibility, everything, and he lost it all uh, for drugs. So hence, I've never touched a drug in my life because I got to see the real world experience of what that looks like. Um, but man, it was an eye opener. And I, I suggest to anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur understand that these are the pitfalls that come along with some of the success. I told you there was 10 crustal bakeries in Philadelphia prior to us to open it up. Well, sure enough, there used to be a thing, and I, I started to discuss this earlier, this thing was called a pretzel curse back in the day. All those pretzel guys had nothing. Now, they made millions and millions of dollars, and not one of them has any money to this day. Zero. And I'm not, I'm not saying nine of them. Ten out of ten had nothing. They lost it all. And the reason they call it the pretzel curse is these guys were so caught up in working hard and making a lot of money, but when they closed at 9 o'clock every morning, they got caught up in the lifestyle of spending this money in, in bad ways, whether it be casinos, racetracks, other bad places. They got hooked on different drugs and they ended up losing it all. And it's a reality of any business now. It's just the pretzel business, but it's a, a, something I see with a lot of young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that have success end up going in a route like this. Um, and it's just a, it's a sad place to be. Uh, when you see it firsthand that everybody has everything you want and you dream of and you get it and so many people piss it away. 
So it's a uh, it's unfortunate part of reality of, of life. So um, so with that, I, I'd like to take some questions because I, I think I have so many stories to tell, but I don't want I want to make sure I have time to, to get some feedback from you guys. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you catch that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, who has a question? Yes. Oh. Okay. Nice. Hi. Hi. Can you give your name just for us, by the way? Uh, my name is Trayvon Bradshaw, and I know one thing you talked about is how your second business has failed and Len, he didn't want to open up any other businesses after that because of the feel of failure. So I was wondering, did you have that same feeling? And if so, how did you overcome that fear? What helped you to persevere and push on? Well, I think, and Len would be, if he was here, he would tell you the same thing. I think Len was, um, well, two things. It's, he was married, so it was a little different. Um, I, one thing I do tell people is there's a, such a benefit you can start a business at 100 years old, but there is a huge benefit when you start younger because of the fact that the, the scary part is when you fail, if I would have failed, my mom loves me, she would take me back in, hopefully, <laughs> and uh, she would let me live there, um, and I could, but when you have responsibilities to other people and kids and family, and he was in that spot, I think he was too scared to, to give his, it was because of the family, is yeah. really what it comes down to. I didn't have that, plus the passion for the business. I wanted to be successful. I would have failed five more stores um, and continued to go to the next one. I think that's what you're built with that mindset of, you know, I'm going to continue to make it grow and work. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be around other entrepreneurs, and they have the same mindset. They've all had that failure story. There's a ton of them. There's people in this room that have had these stories um, that have seen failures, and it's those guys. And you're going to have them. There's no doubt about it. And whether it's life, it doesn't have to just be in business. It's life, and it's uh, it's going to knock you down once in a while. So, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Skyler, and um, when you were approached about doing Undercover Boss, were you at all concerned with how media would portray your company and whether it would portray it in a positive or negative light? Yeah, that's a the really, I'll tell you, these companies that do this, um, it's really scary because we were, at the time we went on the show, we were the smallest company to ever be on Undercover Boss. And I look at it and go, I wasn't worried about embarrassing myself on the show. I was really worried about the fact that we had people's life savings racked up in these stores. And if I did something wrong, it could damage their store. And that really scared me. But I, wonder, I think about some of these other companies that had billion dollar companies, multi-billion dollar companies, and they could damage the brand so badly on the show. If anybody, has anybody seen the one with the episode of Hooters on there by any chance? Okay. Hooters aired on Thursday night. Um, yeah. So on Hooters, if you've seen it, it wasn't the best episode. It didn't make the CEO look that good to say the least. Checkers, if you're familiar with Checkers, Checkers was going to buy out um, Hooters on Monday of the next Monday. The deal, the Hooters CEO made it look so bad that they killed the deal. Um, that's how it, it was that poor of a show. So I knew about that episode. I knew that it happened. So it was definitely scary. What if somebody says something inappropriate? Do I jump in? Do I not jump in? There was no doubt. There was a lot of fear. Um, for us, the, the fact that we could never pay. 17 million people watched it the first time it aired so many times. We could never buy that kind of advertising. So we took a chance. Uh, the only thing is we were in season three, and uh, so the first two seasons aired, and they were pretty much, for the most part, they made the CEO, CEO look pretty decent, in a positive light, I think most people would say. Well, I was, the first episode of season three was a place called Diamond Entertainment. Um, I don't know if anybody saw that one, it was a timeshare place. Well, the guy was, to say the least, horrible. I mean, they really made him look bad. And I was like, oh my God, they're gonna turn this on me. And they made the first two years the CEOs look good. Now the third year is to bash the CEOs because the scary part about this show is they, they tell you um, they can change your voice and say whatever words you want to. So what happens is you go into a studio after a show film, after a film, and you go in and say words. The, uh, uh, A, B, B, B. And they're like, we can make it say anything you want. In fact, 
at the end of mine, I bought a gentleman a new car on the thing. They didn't air that part. They dubbed it in and bought him health insurance. Uh, but I had bought the guy a new car. And I was like, that's not what I said, but they completely dubbed it in and it's amazing they could do it. So I was so, and I knew the contract was 700 pages um, and it's take it or leave it. You can't really negotiate that kind of thing. Um, so it was so scary to think if I make this look to come off bad, what it could do. And, and really, again, I was worried more about the franchisees being affected in a negative way because, again, it could ruin the business overnight. And uh, people, again, put everything they have in this business. In fact, some people say me and Len were risk takers. I didn't really think we were that big risk takers, 24 years old, 25 years old, um, no kids, no real family at the time. Uh, we only had to support ourselves. We have franchisees that come in all the time that you know have got let go from corporate America after being in there for 25 years. Sad story, and they can't find another job, and they're you know 52 years old, 55 years old, and they're saying, I'm gonna, I'd rather just control my own destiny. I'll take all my money and put it in there. Well, it's a scary part because they got kids. They got kids wanting to go to college. There's a lot of responsibility, and it falls on your shoulders to hope they do a good job. And, and sometimes you have to turn them down, um, which is amazing. Like you know, they want to sign up, and we turn them down all the time. We've turned down two for every three candidates that come in because we don't think they'll be a good fit for us. But we're protecting ourselves and the brand, but we're also protecting them because we don't want them to put three hundred thousand dollars into an investment and lose it all. And that potentially, that really could happen. So it was truly scary. In Wawa, you know. uh, they don't franchise. What's that, Wawa? Wawa. And so I'm just wondering, you know, did you ever consider not to franchise and just expand? Yep. Well, truth be told, Wawa used to franchise. So Wawa, uh, I grew up in Ben Salem, and Wawa still had a franchise in Ben Salem until last year. They bought the last guy out. So they used to have 34 franchises, just to give you a little enlightenment, on Wawa. And eventually they decided to go to corporate stores, so they changed their mindset and do corporate stores. Um, and we had thought about that. Originally, um, some days I still think about waking up, believe me when I tell you. Um, I had 10 stores where I did a 50-50 partnership where I owned 100% of the company, but I shared 50% of the profits. Um, I, I did that up to 2005 when we started franchising. Um, the problem for it is it really is tough to grow um, and continue to run that many stores and get that many good people to operate the stores. It has come up and once in a while we go, oh my God, I wish I could do it because it, franchising is tough in the sense that when I go into a store, um, they're partners with us, right? So I can't just walk around and tell them, fix the light bulb, press the thumb booker and point it out. I really have to explain why these things are beneficial to your business and really educate them. I can't go in as a dictator and just tell them what to do. It has to be a collaborative effort. Um, and uh, sometimes that's tough to be honest with you. And sometimes I go, man, I'd rather just own all the stores but for me, 200 stores and $300,000 a piece would be an expensive uh, number to, to borrow that kind of money. Um, and it, it's out there, potentially, but the run would be a, a nightmare. And sometimes we can't get in places like the Philadelphia Zoo. We might not be able to get in the zoo or Philadelphia Airport, for that matter. We got to Philadelphia Airport. That was because the franchisee had a relationship within the airport. So I would have never been able to do that without franchising. Just like McDonald's, McDonald's could afford to open up a lot more of McDonald's corporate stores. They do it because they need good operators to run the stores. And that's really what it is. Thank you. No problem. Uh, my name's Kevin. My question is, uh, in the beginning when you were first starting out, uh, did any of your family or friends doubt you? And if so, how did you respond to that? Yeah, um, my mom did not. Um, but I didn't borrow any money from her or anything. I didn't want to, I didn't want to burden her with borrowing from her. Um, friends did, I'll tell you, friends were, were very negative. Uh, people couldn't believe we were gonna quit our jobs. They were stable jobs, they were okay jobs. We could have had an okay life. Um, but I will tell you this, people have said this before, people are gonna be negative on a business, especially one like ours that no one did it before. Uh, and there was a lot of naysayers out there. You know, when I've talked to other entrepreneurs, they've gone through it all. And the reason they say it's people want you to succeed. There is a lot of people that want you to succeed, but also sometimes your close friends don't want to see you get out of the 
their world. They want to be together with you. And by you having a business or, or going off, there was a lot of negative, uh, and they were not positive. In fact, it wasn't supposed to be me and Len together. It was supposed to be a few other people, and they chose not to want to do it with us. Um, and I'm sure they regret that decision now, but it was, uh, it, it was supposed to be more people. But, but then even the people we approached about it, um, the family and friends, um, then we brought the idea up before we actually did it. We sort of started telling people we were thinking about it before we, I, but we were, in, we were already doing it. We were in the midst of it all. But when we told everybody we were thinking about it, and the reason we said that was because they were so negative on it that it was, uh, we could say, well, we're just thinking about it. It was one of those kind of things. But there was a lot of naysayers. And it's going to happen, there's no doubt, especially when you're going to sort of challenge the norm in this business. You know, if you think about, I gave you the prices. We were selling 100 pretzels for $13. Just think about what it takes, how many pretzels you need to sell to, to make a living out of it. Um, you know, it, it seemed unreasonable. And I, sometimes I go, who's eating all these pretzels? I mean, 175 million pretzels uh, is a lot of pretzels every year, and it, it continues to grow and grow. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Hi. When you were opening your own stores in the beginning, could you just talk a little bit about some of the factors that would influence your decision on where to put them, and what would you really consider one of the big influencing factors as far as costs, like right. employees, or taxes, and payroll, or yeah. healthcare? Well, two things on that. One is, you know what's crazy? My biggest fear opening business up was taxes and payroll. Like, they were the scariest things, and by the way, they're the two easiest things, because someone will do those, and they, there's so many experts out there that can do it. I should have been worried about how am I getting customers, how am I going to make the product, all those things. But I wasn't even thinking about that. I was only thinking about, and it, it scared me to death, almost scared me not to do it, the, the payroll and stuff. Uh, Location-wise, we learned a lot. We've closed stores. I don't want to make it seem like we had 200 stores and every one was a success. We've closed stores. In fact, one of the early stores, um, we, we ended up going to Westchester University, right off of campus Westchester. And the reason we went there was it was a college. We were like, oh, all those students, they'll eat pretzels and all. And you know what we realized? It was one of the biggest mistakes ever. We don't do 1% of our business with Westchester University, yet it's only a few hundred yards away from the, the store. Um, and you know what happens? We didn't know our own business. I told you earlier, our average person buys 35 pretzels. I went to East Stroudsburg here for all those, those years. Led my best friend and roommate, he didn't buy me a slice of pizza one time. Not one time. In fact, I remember going to a pizza shop right here, and the slice was a dollar ten. He bought a slice already. He had extra ten cents. I needed it ten cents, so I didn't have to break a dollar. And he goes, "I'm not giving you the ten cents." <laughs> College kids typically, in a way, they're selfish in the sense that not selfish in, in a bad way, but we have to watch every dollar that we have. We can't go in and say, "Let's buy beers for everybody at the bar." We can't go and say, "Let's buy fifty pretzels to take back to the fraternity house." Um, we didn't have that kind of money, so Westchester's not that type of school. Um, people would come in and buy one pretzel at a time. Thankfully, uh, Westchester University is a county seat, so there's tons of lawyers, and a lot of the lawyers would come in and get boxes of pretzels for their whole staff and stuff like that, so it really made that story successful. But I got one story to tell you about um, another story, because I have a sort of a positive and a, a negative long story. You saw up there, I told you I had a couple stories. One in Morristown, New Jersey, I opened up in Morristown, New Jersey. By the way, we had this huge success in Philadelphia. Things were going great in Philadelphia. I said, let's go to Morristown, New Jersey. We'll start franchising our, guess what everybody says? It'll never work in, Morris, in New Jersey. I go, it's 15 minutes from Philadelphia. It'll never work. Just like I heard it'll never work with the original store, I heard it'll never work in New Jersey. The water's different, this or that. They don't eat them in Jersey. Um, <laughs> so I ended up doing the store myself. I had uh, opened a store up in Morristown, New Jersey, and it did really good, right off the bat. In fact. I paid for the store in four weeks. It was my best store ever. In four weeks, I paid for the whole entire store. Uh, I got in very reasonable on that store. So me and my partner, and again, I have a partner there, op he's an operating partner, he's 50-50 there. I said, let's go to the next town, a couple towns away. We go to Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And it's only a couple months later. We opened it like two months after we opened up, three months. So we opened up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and uh, the store worked my luck again. It's another done. Right? So first one's great, a couple miles down the road, same clientele, same customers, it just doesn't work. So long story short, my partner works it out for a couple months, he's there, he's working there, working there. Um, 
And one day I go to the main fair store, the original store. Now the main fair store does tremendous amount of buying. I mean, uh, you know, mil millions of couples a year at that particular store. So I go there on a Saturday morning, five o'clock in the morning, I'm driving in, my employees don't expect me to come there, and I pull up, and guess what? They're all sitting on the curb out front. There's 11 employees sitting on the curb. And I, uh, I caught you a moment, like one of those, you're supposed to be working, and our rule is you're not allowed to take breaks together, and you have to take breaks in the back of the store, you're not allowed to take them out front. So they're like, no, the power's off. And I go, what do you mean the power's off? They go, there's no power. They go, the lights are on. They go, the three-phase power. Well, three-phase makes the mixer work, and without the mixer, we can't make dough, and you can't have pretzels. So I go, oh my God. So I saw a Pico crew, electric crew down the street, and I went up to them, and I said, listen, what's going on? They said, your, your three-phase is out, and uh, it's gonna be out all day. And I was like, oh, it's a beautiful Saturday in June. We're gonna miss the whole day. So now I had that story in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the dog, the, the dog was doing horrible. So I said, you know what? I have a van, get my van, bring the flower with us, jump in this van, and we'll go into Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And we have two vans, and every, we basically go in there. I don't tell them I'm coming. There's only two employees at that store, a counter person and a baker, that's all they needed, so it's 12. We walk in with bags of flour on our shoulders, like a military operation, 15 people are coming in. And I keep one girl back at the uh, at the main store, the main fair store, and uh, we're twisting away, and these two employees have never seen this many pretzels being made. And every 15 minutes we pull a truck up, we load it between six and eight hard pretzels. And we put it in the, in the van and we drive it back over to the main fair store, because the soda in it, uh, the cases work, everything else at Mayfair. So we sell pretzels all day long, day goes off, perfect. Uh, perfect day in Mayfair. So at the end of the day, I go back to the Cherry Hill store, and I stopped in there just because I want to clean the store up. And the reason I was cleaning up is my partner at that store did not benefit from the Mayfair store because we just brought our own flour and my own crew. I didn't use anything of his. So I was going to leave him a couple extra dollars just for maybe I burned a little more gas that day. And I went to close out the register. And if anybody knows what closing out the register is, you put it on Z. And basically, you hit the thing, and it'll give you a total, and it clears the total out. So, that, so the next day, they start at zero. Okay. So I go to clear it out, and normally my goal, what I would have done there is I'm gonna take the money, I rubber band it with a receipt, I drop it and say, I'm not gonna count it, that's his job, we'll count all the money. So I do it, I turn the key, and I look, and the sales are two and a half times the best day we ever had there, right? Two and a half times. We've been there three months. We haven't had a day even close there. So I said, you know what happened? One of my new, my employees came there and touched the wrong key on the register and added an extra zero a couple times and made this crazy number. So sure enough, now I got to count the money. So I count the money out, and the money's right, right what the key, what the register key says. So I called Pat, the, the owner there, and I said, Pat, did you forget to close out the register? Did you leave the money in the register? And he goes, No. He goes, I yesterday was the normal Friday. So I count the money again, make sure I didn't mess up or anything, trying to figure it out. And then it dawned on me, basically nothing changed that day. And it, this was the one of those aha moments. We, the only thing that changed that day is we looked busy. We had 16 employees in a store that normally has two. We had boxes of pretzels walking out to the car with steam coming off of them. And that was the draw. And that's the energy. And we've all seen it, by the way. If anybody go to uh, Ocean City Boardwalk, down the Ocean City Mac and Nacos Pizza on the boardwalk, right? We all walk by 50 pizza shops. And what one do we stop at? The one that has the line, right? We're drawn to the line. And, and that's what we learned early on is the energy it creates. It creates energy. People want to be around other people. Um, and what do they associate lines with freshness? It must be good, they're standing there. We all follow each other. And that's what was key. And once I learned that, so you know what I changed? In our franchise agreement, you sign a contract that you have to give away three free pretzels for the first week. That was our, our contract, we put it in there. Um, People were like crazy that we're going to spend all this money that you make me give the product away. Are you crazy? And we put it in there. And what we found is it's amazing how many people it brings in um, right from the beginning. In fact, we do it every year. The National Pretzel Day is April 26th in a couple weeks. If you go to any one of our stores, pretzels are free all day. Right? Free pretzels. That's what's crazy about that. Guess what the best day of the year is? Sales wise, April 26th, National Pretzel Day is the best day of the year. We're giving away the product for free. And what we learned is, if you do it the right way, and you give someone free, if anybody's been in one of our National Pretzel Day promotions, you walk in, you go, hi, how you doing? Here's a free pretzel, anything else I can get you. 
And you know what? People feel almost awkward that they accepted something <laughs> and they go, because we've been trained to reciprocate, right? At least, you know, you go to, you get your birthday present, someone gives you a birthday present, right? Thank you, you feel an obligation to do something. Anybody ever get a Christmas present or a gift and they weren't expecting it, they didn't know they were that good of friends and they get it, you feel horrible, and you go over the top and buy them a crazy gift, right? So that's sort of the mindset we learned early on that you can, it, it's amazing what it does, the free pretzels for us, and we require them to do it. In fact, we had Stuart in uh, Baltimore, uh, Delaware, Delaware, so a girl said to me, she goes, Dan, you're going to be my coach besides, you know, all these corporate people, but I want you to be my coach. And uh, tell me every week where I should go. I said, you should give away three, she bought the store, it was already open. She bought it, but she goes, I want to take it to the next level. So I said, give three free pretzels away for a week. Anybody walks in. She goes, no problem. So she's done unbelievable. She does great. Well, guess what? I have to call her six months later. She's still giving away three free pretzels to every customer that walks in six months later. And she's doing tremendously well. Because people, again, came in for three free pretzels. And they're like, give me a cheesecake pretzel, give me a soda, give me a party soda. Um, and it only costs seven cents to make a pretzel. So there's no better advertising. If anybody ever thinking about making impressions and advertising, there's no way we're going to do ads for seven cents uh, uh, for an ad. And we can give away free pretzels all day long. So for us, it's, it's overwhelming. How, how successful that promotion's been over the years and continues to be. Any more questions? Good. Yeah. My name is Stacy. I was curious how many pretzels do you think you eat in a year? I eat, <laughs> I eat one pretzel every day. I eat, whenever they, I, the end, I like the end pretzels, the real dark end pretzels, burn, not a lot of salt. I dip them in cream cheese. I always get the cream cheese. It's stupid. Uh, in there. That's my. Uh, my favorite. And it is amazing though, um, how many people have the, I like the middle pretzel, I don't like those, I like, so when people come in, they'll say, oh, give me those ones from the bottom, I like the real dark, I like the burnt ones, I don't like, everybody's got a, a one particular pretzel they like. And what's interesting is, all our pretzels are hand twisted, if you've been in the stores, they're, they're hand twisted these days. And every single pretzel, not one of them looks things like a snowflake. So. Everybody, like I, in my store, we have 50 employees that make their stores, and I can tell the 50 like different twists, like who's twisted, which one, you can see the way he's spread out. They all might look the same to you, but to me, they all look dramatically different, each one, when you really look at the pretzels. That's good. Hi, my name is Tanya. Um, I'm a small business owner. We are just in the very beginning stages of franchising. What would you say was your biggest hurdle when you first started franchising? Biggest hurdle. Uh, one thing is the legal part of franchising. Um, so let me explain, I don't know if everybody understands really what a franchise is. There's a, they did a survey recently and they asked people what a franchise was and a, a chain. And I don't think you, people think they're the same thing. They're really not. So Starbucks is a chain and Wild Lot is a chain where they're owned by one person. A franchise is somebody who creates a model and then they sell that model. They let people use the name, the recipes, uh, and all the things that go into the franchise model, and they pass a royalty. So my royalty is 6% of their sales. So for every $100 they do, I get $6. And then I also get $2 that goes into a marketing fund that we use for marketing all the stores. So that's sort of the model of franchising. But one of the big hurdles uh, is the legal part of it, really trying to, the, the contract has got to be so well thought out. If you don't mind me, can I ask you what your business is? Popcorn Buddha. Okay, Popcorn Buddha. So you wouldn't believe, yes. Uh, you wouldn't believe the pitfalls that potentially are out there. I mean, like, what is the, where you get the popcorn from? Do you have a backup popcorn? You know, where the kernels come? Those are all the things that we sort of work at. And it took us about a year and a half to get the real document uh, precise and we're it's a it's a live document. We're always changing the document every year. We have to add things because things come up that you go, that'll never I, I remember sitting with a lawyer going, that'll never happen. And sure enough, it has happened over and over again. So it's uh one of the things, but I think the contract was the big one. Um the one other part is really when you're small, the franchise thing is there's a level of you want the relationship with the franchisee, but ultimately what ends up happening is you have a lot of friends and family get in to the business, right? So my first 15 franchises, 10 of them were East Stroudsburg University alumni, <laughs> friends of mine. Uh, and the problem is when you have friends in the business, it really creates some stress.
franchise, but by the way, every franchise company that you talk to, the first 10 or 15 stores are always friends and family. It's just the way it is. It always starts that way. So it's always a challenge. Any other questions? Actually, I have a question. What caused your second store to fail? You know, it's funny, we, we really don't know. I'll tell you, the, the problem, we did everything right. We thought we did everything right. Um, and we still challenge the question all day. And we've seen stores that just uh, just don't do well for some reason. It's just not always a guarantee. Um, and it was really a tough one for me to, to decide to close it. Like sometimes taking a step back is a good step forward. Some people just keep pouring money into a bad business. Uh, and we finally made a commitment to you know pull the plug on it. So, but um, I just want to say I really appreciate you guys having me up here. Uh, it's been awesome to come back and see the campus. It's a true honor for me uh, to be up here and uh, you know experience uh, East Stroudsburg again, see the growth that it's happened. It's, it's I'm very proud alumni. Um, I let everybody know you've seen me. I, I've been on different shows and always say. This, uh, this school East Stroudsburg, and some people always mispronounce the name, and uh, I say how proud I am and how wonderful the school and the relationship uh, and the staff and, and the professors were, were unbelievable to me. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much.